welcome to worship this morning. We offer a special welcome to those who are watching the recording of this service online. We are glad you're worshiping with us. It is important to us to know that you are here. Please fill out the form in the bulletin and place it in the offering plate at the conclusion of the service. Whether you are with us for the first time or a regular part of our church community, we are very glad you are with us. If you are interested in joining the caring community of First Congregational Church of Evanston, you may indicate your interest in membership on the attendance form. Please know that whoever you are and wherever you are on your journey of life and faith, you are welcome here. Today is the first Sunday of Advent. We welcome the Reverend Dr. Carolyn Ann Monroe back to the pulpit, and we thank her for leading today's worship service while Reverend Tim is away. Reverend Dr. Carolyn Ann Monroe is an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ. She has served as a parish pastor, hospital chaplain, development officer, retreat leader, and spiritual director. She is currently a volunteer with the Ignatian Spirituality Project, which provides spiritual companioning for people recovering from homelessness and addiction. She has two sons and two granddaughters, and she and her partner, Callie, live in the Edgewater neighborhood of Chicago, where they enjoy walking and biking. So let us be the church with thankful hearts as we worship God together. Please stand as you are able as the five family lights the first candle of the Advent.
be the peace that dwells between us. God of hope who brought joy, and this world be the joy that dwells between us. God of hope, the rock we stand on, in the center, the focus of our lives always, and particularly this Advent time. In your name we Good to be back. Good to see all of you. We invoke God's presence to be with us, knowing that our first item of business needs to be complete. Knowing that the greatest gift that we can give to God is our honesty. For this joint in our prayer of confession. Coming to Christ, you may not find us. We look away from signs we do not want to see. We stop listening to distress we do not want to hear. We are bound to an inconvenient truth. Keep us alert to our love, to the needs of our neighbors.
out a few announcements. There is no Sunday school today. The children are welcome to remain in the sanctuary for today's service. The Christmas pageant will be on December 19th during 10 a.m. worship service. Pageant rehearsals will be held during the worship services on December 5th and 12th. Children will go to the Fellowship Hall after the lighting of the Advent Reef. The Congregational Budget Meeting will be next Sunday, December 5th at 11 a.m., immediately after the worship service. For those who cannot be present in person, there will be a virtual participation option through Zoom. Details may be found in the weekly email. A farewell reception for David Morrison will be held on Sunday, December 12th from 1 to 3 p.m. Please plan to join us as we wish him well in the next chapter of his life. An Advent brochure and Advent calendars are available in the Narthex. This year's Advent devotional has been delayed by delivery issues at the publisher. We have printed out the first week of devotions. That is also available in the Narthex for you to pick up. Finally, it is time to order poinsettias. There is a form in your bulletin. You may drop it along with the check and the offering plate in the narthex or bring it to the church office during the week. A reading of Isaiah, chapter 64, verse 1. 
verses 1 through 9, the prophet pleads with God to save the people. Listen for God to speak to you through these words of Holy Scripture. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence. As when fire kindles brushwood, and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen God besides you, who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you were angry, and we sinned, because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O oh Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. The Gospel reading is Mark chapter 13, verses 24 through 37. Jesus instructs his followers to keep awake. But in those days after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling down from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the human one coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things take place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only God. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey, when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockroach, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. The word of the Lord. the curtain to rise. In the orchestra pit, the 
The violin bows are poised. The conductor has raised his baton. So begins theologian Frederick Beekner's description of Advent. He continues, the extraordinary thing that is about to happen is matched only by the extraordinary moment just before it happens. Advent is the name of that moment. And Advent is the name of this moment. We've lit the first candle. Many of us are wearing purple. It's Advent. I don't know about you, but I could really use Advent right now. Advent is, of course, a season of anticipation. The name itself, Advent, comes from the Latin word adventus, meaning coming. Something is coming, something we anticipate, something we hope for, something we prepare for, something we desperately need. In the Northern Hemisphere here, what seems to be coming is darkness. The days are shorter, the nights are longer. The day, in ancient times when the understanding of the patterns of the cosmos were more superstition than science, this seasonal shift led to fear. What if it didn't stop? getting darker? What if the sun just went away and never came back? They lit candles against the darkness, against the fear, and they prayed to God to bring the sun back. And every year, God did. The light came back, was in fact born into the world again every year. While we have come to understand far better the movements of the planets, our position in the solar system, our physical relationship with the star that is our sun, we still experience, as our ancestors did, the dread of encroaching darkness. The fear that comes with confronting something we can't control, have no power over. Things like pandemics, and politics, and systemic social ills. Our ancestors discovered they could light candles and oil lamps against the darkness. We came up with incandescent light bulbs, fluorescents, halogens, LEDs, but we can't make it go away entirely. That darkness, we feel it, it engulfs us. Its dread grips us. And so we come to Advent, a time of coming. Both of our scripture lessons this morning were written for and by people who were in a time of darkness. They didn't have a season of Advent. The church wouldn't come up with that till about the fourth or fifth century, but they were sure in the mood for it, hoping that something was coming, anticipating that it might, preparing themselves for God to do something to break the darkness they were living in. The Isaiah passage addresses the despair that was felt in post-exile Jerusalem. Jerusalem had been conquered and pretty much destroyed early in the 6th century before Christ. Most of the people had been marched off to Babylon to exile taken from their home, from the land God had given them, and held as slaves 
in a foreign place for 50 years, an entire generation. When Babylon itself was conquered by Persia, the exile ended. They were allowed to return to their beloved Jerusalem. Return to what they expected to be normal. But it turns out it wasn't normal at all. Jerusalem had been destroyed. Wasn't there anymore. There was nothing left of what they remembered. They had to rebuild it. They had to start over from scratch. Besides which, not everybody had been taken into exile. Some people had been left behind and had been continuing to live in what was left. And some new people from other places had moved in. And they weren't so wild about these people coming back from exile, wanting their old Jerusalem back. Land battles and feuds broke out. There were overly pious zealots imposing their religious restrictions on people who felt that God had abandoned them entirely. And so were less inclined to want God involved going forward. It was a chaotic, hostile mess. Not a lot unlike a nation where on every single election, political decision or public health recommendation, half the country feels vindicated while the other half feels cheated out, imposed upon, and oppressed. It was a time of darkness, anticipating that God was doing something, or should be doing something, but not sure what it was going to be. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence. Come, God. Quick, and fix this, please. Six centuries later, Jesus would indeed come. And he would come into another time of great darkness. The people who came out of the Babylonian exile to reestablish Jerusalem would never actually rule themselves again. They would rebuild Jerusalem as vassals of Persia, which would then become part of the spoils of Alexander the Great's conquests, and ultimately under the occupation of the Roman Empire. The people Jesus was speaking to were very much looking forward to God doing something to rescue them and what Jesus said to them was, look, pay attention, watch, notice. I can't give you a date, but there will be changes. It'll be subtle, like how the branches of a tree are bare one day, and then suddenly have leaves on them the next. But if you noticed closely, they'd been softening and budding. Small changes, easily missed. Keep alert. Something's coming. The very message of Advent. The season of coming. Keep alert. Pay attention. Something's coming. And so our season of Advent begins. When it originated in the fourth century, Advent was actually six weeks long. It was the six weeks before the Feast of the Epiphany, the baptism of Jesus. One of the two times a year when new converts to Christianity were baptized. The other one was Easter which was preceded by a six-week period called Lent. These two six 
six-week preparatory period were times of fasting and praying, of reflection and repentance. For the new Christians, they were times of preparing themselves for the new life in Christ. For the not-so-new Christians, they were times of renewal and recommitment to their faith. By about the 6th or 7th century, Advent became associated with the Feast of Nativity on December 25th, and it was shortened to four weeks. But still, a time of fasting and penitence, not much fun at all. It wasn't until the 16th century that German Lutherans, who we don't tend to think of as the fun ones, <laughs> but strangely, it was the German Lutherans began to mark Advent with an Advent wreath of four candles, lit consecutively for four weeks. And it was not till the 19th century that it had a ritual that there was a liturgy associated with it. And the weeks of Advent were given meaning. Now, all of this fascinating background is merely to explain why the season of Advent, as well established as it is, has a wide variety of practices in assigning meanings or themes to the weeks. The church I grew up in the weeks were prophecy, preparation, proclamation, and rejoicing. I have no idea where they got that. <laughs> None whatsoever. In another church I attended for a while, the weeks were prophets, Mary and Joseph, shepherds, and angels. It had to have been designed by somebody in the Sunday school park. <laughs> Probably the most widespread, and the themes are the themes of hope, peace, joy, and love, which Pastor Tim said he thought was probably what you all do here too. <laughs> what we name the weeks of Advent matters far less than how we use them to prepare ourselves to be open to what God is doing, to prepare ourselves for what's coming. Now, I mentioned at the very beginning of the service that I could really use this Advent. A year and a half ago, about two or three months into the pandemic, when that little boost that we got of the Easter resurrection began to wear pretty thin on my heart and my soul, and Hallie and I made the painful decision postpone our October 2020 wedding, I suddenly got this earworm. The musicians will understand this. You can, something pops in your head, you can't get it out. Got this earworm. The song from the show made, I need a little Christmas. Right this very minute. It was, you know, April, but I need a little <laughs> Christmas. I set my sights on Christmas. I look forward eagerly to what I anticipated would be the joyous freedom from the fears and the burdens and the constraints of a virus we had no treatment for at that point and couldn't figure out how to contain. The freedom of anxiety over a national election which no matter how it went would at least be over and settled and we could get on with our lives, knowing at least what it was and not needing to be constantly bombarded by the vitriol and the bitterness of conflict, the advertisements, the rhetoric. I just longed to be free of it. I longed for Christmas, sure that it'd be over by then, candles in the window, carols at the spin. I needed a little Christmas right then. Well, as we know, things didn't really go as I planned. They often don't, but this was a real disappointment. There wasn't an easy fix, either to the public health crisis
crisis, the political divisiveness, or the social turmoil that seemed to persist. There still is. And what I've come to realize is that what I really need is a little admin, or maybe really a lot of admin. What I did last year was focus on getting to Christmas rather than being in admin. I didn't take advantage of the gifts of this time, of preparation, of anticipation. And so I was disappointed. In order to even begin to be ready to receive the gift and the promise of Christmas, the presence of God in my life, the reality of God doing what God is doing, the way God is doing it, the power of God actually being in my world, I need to get ready. And so this year I've made the conscious decision to be in Advent, to immerse myself in hope, in peace, in joy, and in love. And so here is how I have decided to try to do that this year, how I'm going to practice this time of coming to, getting ready for what's coming. I'm going to practice hope. I've been thinking about and trying to identify what it is I actually hope for.
Each moment of every day is an opportunity for me to recognize joy. It doesn't deny the reality of a pandemic. It doesn't erase the difficulty of not having been able to travel to see my grand, brand new granddaughter or, or to hug the two-year-old. It doesn't eliminate the deep sadness of not having been able to be with dear loved ones while they were still alive. All of that stuff is still very real. But it's not the only thing that is real. Joy is real too. God is coming. And that's real. And finally, I'm going to practice love. This Advent, I'm going to work to notice all the love that's extended to me. All the love that surrounds me, all the love that I take for granted and don't seem to notice. I'm also going to try to pay more attention to people who don't seem to feel love. I truly believe that God loves us all, each and every one of us, more than we can imagine. I also believe, even though I sometimes forget to act like it, that God loves the people who annoy me and make me angry. And I need to learn to love them as well. And I'm going to work on sharing that belief I have that God loves everybody. Living it out, spreading it around, so that the people who don't believe they are loved or don't feel it might, in fact, feel it and believe it. Advent is a time for us to decide what it is we're waiting for and what we want to do to be ready for it. Do we wait for a status quo? For greater darkness, for life to continue to disappoint us? Do we wait simply to get back to normal? Whatever that was. By the way, I find no place in the Bible where God ever takes people back to where they were. <laughs> so, do we wait for going back, or do we live with hope, peace, joy, and love for God to answer our prayers, to rock our world, to bring the ultimate light into our darkness? I will close as I began with the end of Beekner's reflection on Advent. The Salvation Army Santa Claus clangs his bell. The sidewalks are so crowded you can hardly move. Exhaust fumes are the chief fragrance in the air, and everybody is as bundled up against any sense of what all the fuss is really about as they are bundled up against the windchill factor. But if you concentrate for just an instant, far off, in the deeps of yourself, somewhere, you can feel the beating of your heart. For all its madness and lostness, not to mention your own, you can hear the world itself holding its breath. Blessed Advent to you. Amen.
We come to you this morning in Advent hope of God. We live in hope that those affected by hardships, by COVID, by fires, by storms, by floods, by drought, will find long-term resolution in the We live in hope that those without a job will get the new training and the encouragement we live in hope that people of color will know and experience that their lives matter. We live in hope that indigenous persons in this country will get the respect, education, and practical help they need. We live in hope that those coming to our borders in search of asylum and a new life of freedom will find welcome and opportunity. We live in hope, O oh God, that those who are financially challenged will see and be able to find hope. We live in hope that those who are troubled and depressed will find a listening presence and an understanding shoulder to cry on. We live in hope that those who are sick or hospitalized will know the peace in the painful hours and will sense your uplifting and sustaining presence. We live in hope that members of our own family and members of our church family will find healing and peace. We remember in the silence of our hearts those who are sick or troubled, those who we have just lifted to you in prayer. We live in the eternal hope that those who have died are safe in your loving presence and that the bereaved will be comforted. We live in hope, O oh God, that the life-giving values of your kingdom will take root in our society. We live in hope that our hidden talents will be revealed and put to work in ways that are faithful. We live in hope that in all of our life we will know your love around us, for us, and with us. We live in hope, for in Jesus Christ we see that your hope for the world, O oh God, is human, practical, and positive, and we pray for your guidance to spread this hope in the world, in whose name you were taught to pray. Our Father, Lord of the service where we offer ourselves as an offertory to God, a response and gratitude for what God has done for us. When I was a, a little girl, on my grandmother's dresser here was a little, like, calling card, a sized card that said, what on earth are you doing for heaven's sake? Which, which was how I uh, understood it, being a little girl, tending to get myself in trouble. Like, what on earth are you doing, for heaven's sake? It was a while before I realized that what the card actually said is, what on earth are you doing for heaven's sake? And so as we dedicate and offer ourselves to God, we do it with that kind of a mindset. What on earth are we doing? in gratitude for all that God has given us. Let us join together in our offering. Thank you. 
thank you, God, 